They changed the position tonight. <laughs> Usually the strategic place is there. Okay. Good evening, everybody, and, and welcome to the Africa Day Memorial Lecture for 2015. Um, it is a great occasion for us to be able to host this lecture. And, uh, and let me first welcome a number of, of, of people and, uh, and then let me talk about what this lecture means and why should we be thinking about these issues. First of all, let me welcome our, our speaker, uh, Professor Alcinda Gonwana, Professor Lucius Botz, uh, the Dean of the Faculty of Humanities, Professor Caroline Nicholson, the Dean of Law, the deans who are not here shall not be welcome. <laughs> uh, Ms. Cornelia Fassen, and of course, Profer Professor he Heidi Hudson, who is the, the, the shaker and mover behind this, this, this uh, occasion. I believe that we have with us representatives from the Department of Sports, Art, Culture, and Recreation, and from the Mahaun Municipality, and we have colleagues from the Faculty of Humanities, students, uh, members of the, of the staff of, of the Center for African Studies. And I just want to thank you for being part of tonight. And it's very, very nice to see young people in the audience. I mean, this is the kind of university that we are trying to build. This lecture forms part of the program in celebration of, 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 of Africa, but also uh, as part of the interdisciplinary project organized by the, by the Center of, of, of African Studies on contemporary modes of othering. Uh, it's a very interesting issue, and I was talking to Professor Hudson to try and understand what they mean by othering and how many otherings they were looking at. And since this had been in the making for a while, it is simply serendipity that at the time in which this country has a lot to think about what it is to be African and what it is to be part of the African continent, this conference is taking place. If you think about the things that are happening in the country at the broader macro level, but also in terms of the different forms of a student protest or interventions that have taken place in the last few months, the question about what it is to be African, what it is to be an African university, who are we and who is the other, if the other actually exists as such, uh, are very pertinent issues. So I'm delighted to be here officiating tonight and to be part of this, um, of this lecture. Now, because this is a celebration, we also have something that we usually do not have in these occasions, which is a performance. I am very pleased to introduce to you V chords. For a moment, I look at the word, I said, oh God, another Afrikaans word that I'm not going to be able to pronounce. <laughs> but isn't, it's actually quite normal, it's V chords. It's an a cappella group, and it's a group of singers dedicating to the sharing of a story through music. The course was created to explore and perform different genres of music in different languages across our globe, which is very nice. Hope you sing in Spanish too. And we believe, they believe that the music that they perform as not only to just perform, but it also serves as a means to grow of them as individuals and to be able to share experiences with their audiences. At the end of May, uh, of May uh, the course would be celebrating its first year of existence, and the group has done numerous performances at the University of the Free State and also with the Department of Education in, in, in Bloemfontein. Um, the group has performed at the Chancellor Dinner last year in, in, in July. They also sang at the National Teachers Award, uh, what was held in last, last year in November. And they also performed at the Well Done Function uh, that Anna presented by the Department of Education in January. Um, the group sang at the launch of the new foyer of the SRC building. That's very nice to know. And um, recently they did the opening of the 11th annual registrars in Visa. Wow, it must have been interesting. Uh, just in up the registrars, which took place at the university, at our university in 2014. So given that they have been able to just up registrars, I think we cannot wait to hear what you're going to perform for us. So please. Scroll. 
start off your sleep. Oh, motherland, cradle me. Close my eyes, lullaby me to sleep. Keep me safe, lie with me. Stay beside me, don't go. Don't you go.
Thank you so much. That was really brilliant. And I'm not going to try to follow that act. <laughs> <coughs> it's my privilege to introduce to you our guest speaker of tonight, Professor um, Alcinda Honwana. She is currently visiting professor of anthropology and international development at the Open University in the United Kingdom. She was also chair in international development at the Open University and taught anthropology at the University of Eduardo Modlane in Maputo, the University of Cape Town in South Africa, and also the New School of Social Research in New York. And while waiting, while you were still coming in, I actually also discussed a bit with her, and it seems it's not too bad to commute between New York and, and London for her work, although she will use the opportunity to go back a bit to Maputo as well and visit her home ground. Um, she was also program director at the Social Science Research Council in New York and worked for the United Nations Office for Children and Armed Conflict. She holds doc a doctoral degree from SOAS, the School of Oriental and African Studies um, at the University of London and also a master's degree in social anthropology from that same university and institution. She also holds a master's degree in sociology at the University of Paris and then a BA in History and Geography at the University of Eduardo Modlani. Um, <clears throat> her research actually deals with political conflict and culture and on the impact of violent conflict on children and youth, conducting research in Mozambique, the DRC, Angola, Colombia, and Sri Lanka. Her latest work has been on youth and social change in Africa, focusing on Mozambique, Senegal, South Africa, and Tunisia. Alcinda Onwana's latest book include Youth and Revolution in Tunisia, 2013, The Time of Youth, Work, Social Change, and Politics in Africa, it, was, it came out in 2012, Child Soldiers in Africa, 2006, and Makers and Breakers, Children and Youth in Post-Colonial Africa in 2005, which he co-edited. She also was awarded the very prestigious Prince Klaus Chair for Development and Equity in the Netherlands in 2007. And for those of you that also believe in multilingualism, she's fluent in English, French, Portuguese, also in Spanish, and then two indigenous languages, of which one is Shangan and another one, which I forget the pronunciation in, in Mozambique. We're really much looking forward to your address tonight, and she will address us on youth protest and political change in Africa. Prof. Alcinda, thank you so much. It is a pleasure to be here, and I would like to thank the Center for African Studies at the University of the Free State for inviting me to be the keynote speaker on this important occasion. I'm particularly, and particularly I would like to thank Professor Heidi Hudson and her staff uh, for all the arrangements that made my visit here to Bloemfontein possible. But I also want to thank all of you for being here this evening. It's really a pleasure to be here with you, all of you. Let me start my remarks with a word about the recent attacks against African immigrants including my fellow Mozambicans working and living in South Africa. These outrageous acts are totally unacceptable, particularly in a region that shares so much history and prides itself of the tremendous solidarity in our common struggles for independence, racial equality, social justice, and political rights. These acts of violence must be strongly condemned. But as social scientists, we have the obligation to go beyond the mere condemnation of this behavior and try to understand the underlying causes for this phenomenon. 
Is this just a result of fierce competition for jobs and livelihoods amongst the poor of the poorest? Are poverty, unemployment, and economic hardship the only reasons behind this violence? Could it be that the needs, the aspirations, the suffering, and the lives of the other matter less than our own? Or could this be a disregard or ignorance about our shared history of colonial oppression, racial discrimination, and national liberation? How can we, as social scientists, shed light on these critical questions? How can we help decision makers address the serious threat that undermines the relationship of South Africans with their neighbors and risks to derail the efforts for peaceful and mutually beneficial regional integration? This is indeed the challenge we face. But this evening, I would like to focus your attention on the lives of young Africans struggling with unemployment, the difficulty of finding sustainable livelihoods, and the absence of civil liberties. Political instability, bad governance, and failed neoliberal social and economic policies have exacerbated long-standing societal problems and diminished young people's ability to support themselves and their families. Many are unable to attain the prerequisites of full adulthood and take their right place as fully fledged members of society. The recent wave of youth protests can best be understood in the context of this generation's struggles for economic, social, and political emancipation. In this lecture this evening, I'll develop three fundamental arguments. First, young Africans are living in weighthood a prolonged period of suspension between childhood and adulthood. I found the notion of weighthood, to which I'll return later, particularly relevant to analyze this stalemate. Youth transitions to adulthood have become so uncertain that the growing number of young me women and men must improvise livelihoods and conduct their personal relations outside dominant economic and familial frameworks. Their predicament is particularly galling, but it also inspires some to devise creative solutions. In recent years, the accelerated economic growth in the continent raised hope for solving many socioeconomic challenges. Yet, there is skepticism amongst the youth that growth alone with no equity will bring a solution to their problems. My second argument is that the wave of protest movements led mainly by young people stem directly from the economic and social pressures they suffer and from their pervasive political marginalization. Consequently, the young are moving from dispersed and unstructured social and political acts into more organized street protests. And thirdly, while these social movements have been able to overthrow regimes, systemic transformation takes time and requires more than mere change in leadership. Major challenges arise 
in the process of transition as the new political order is being established. Young activists appear to be struggling to translate the political grievances of the protest movement into a broader political agenda. Clearly, they seem to be more united in defining what they don't want and fighting it, much, and much less so in articulated what they collectively want. The, quick, the key questions then become how to play an active role in politics and governance beyond street protests, and how to create the space for a new kind of politics. Let me start with four specific instances. The protests in Tunisia in 2010, 2011, brought thousands of young women and men from diverse social structure into the streets to demand jobs, better living conditions, and freedom of expression. These protests led to the ousting of the, the 23-year dictatorship of President Ben Ali. The Tunisian uprising started what some analysts called the Arab Spring and is inspired similar activism within the continent, in the Middle East, and more globally. However, after the housing of the regime, formal political parties superseded the broad-based coalition of the street protests and marginalized the young activists. Similarly, in Egypt, young people organized around three major youth movements, the Kefaya movement, which means enough, the April 6 youth movement, and the We Are All Khaled Said movement, and marched to and gathered in Tahrir Square to protest against the regime and successfully hosted President Hosni Mubarak. However, in the post-Mubarak period, young people have been sidelined by established political forces that took control of the political space. Rallying around the movement Yan Amar, which means enough is enough, Senegalese young people using the slogan Ma carte d'électeur mon arme, meaning my voting card, my weapon, they launched a national campaign that led to the removal of President Abdullahi Wad from office in the national elections of February 2012. More recently, in October 2014, large numbers of young people in Burkina Faso took to the streets to demand the end of President Blaise Campaore's 27-year rule. Campaore was working on a constitutional amendment to allow him to run a, for a third term. However, these young people, most of whom spent their entire lives under his rule, were eager for change. Organized through the movement Sassoufi, which means again, it's enough, and uh, Le, Bayon, Le Ballet Citoyen, or the Citizen's Broom, these young people forced President Campaore to step down. These four sets of events in North and, in North and West Africa, which successfully overthrew longstanding leaders, are part of a wider wave of protests throughout the continent that has seen large numbers of people, especially the young, taking to the streets to protest against the status quo. Driven by similar causes, street demonstrations took place in numerous countries, including Angola, Cameroon, Djibouti, Gabon, Libya, Malawi, Mozambique, Nigeria, Sudan, Swaziland, amongst other places. 
although many popular uprisings were brutally repressed and did not result in the fall of governments, it was clear that the tides were turning. While some analysts believed that regime change through peaceful protest wouldn't be possible beyond North Africa, therefore the naming Arab Spring, which purposefully divorces these protests from their African location. And the cases of Senegal in 2012 and more recently Burkina Faso in 2014 clearly dismiss such claims. The events in Africa inspired a global movement. For youth protests have mushroomed worldwide since then. Middle Eastern countries such as Iran, Bahrain, Yemen, Syria, and Turkey faced similar social unrest caused by youth demonstrations. In Europe, Portugal's young people from the so-called Geração Arrasca, meaning the precarious generation, took to the streets to denounce unemployment and high cost of living. In Spain, the Indignados, or indignant movement, has been protesting against economic inequalities and the lack of prospects for the young people. And the UK also witnessed violent riots by young people from the poorest neighborhoods following the killing of a young black man. In South America, South America Chile, Chilean students filled the streets of Santiago to demand high quality and low cost public education. While in Brazil, thousands of youth organized by the Movimento Pass Livre, or Free Fair Movement, came out to protest, protest inadequate social services, corruption, and the financial scandals surrounding the mega sports projects for the 2013 World Cup. In the United States, the Occupy Wall Street movement rallied many young Americans to protest against corporate greed and the undue influence of corporations over government. And in Hong Kong, Chinese students launched, launched the Umbrella Movement and began a civil disobedience campaign that occupied and paralyzed major street intersections in the city center to demand full universe, universal suffrage for the chief executive elections. So beyond the disparities in their material, cultural and political situations, young people in rich and poor countries are affected by similar problems of unemployment, exclusion, and restricted futures. And they are beginning to assert their rights as citizens, claiming a new space for themselves. But what factors make weighthood in Africa particularly depressing? Young Africans constitute a disenfranchised majority, largely excluded from major socioeconomic institutions and political processes. Whatever their class background, many youths cannot afford to form families and households and are unable to become fully independent and partake in the privileges and responsibilities of social adulthood. Lige, which means in Wolof, the national language of Senegal means work, is celebrated as an important marker of adulthood. The ability to work and provide for themselves and others defines a person's self-worth and position in the family and community. Yet, the majority of the young people in Senegal and elsewhere in Africa are unable to attain the sense of dignity embedded in the notion of Lige. 
In southern Mozambique, in the past, becoming a labor migrant in South Africa constituted a rite of passage into adulthood, as jobs in the South African mines helped young Mozambicans to become husbands, fathers, and providers to their families, and in turn, allowed young women to become wives, mothers, and homemakers. Today, however, African societies do not offer reliable pathways into adulthood. Traditional ways of making these transitions have been broken down, and new ways of attaining adult status are yet to be developed. I use the notion of weighthood, which means waiting for adulthood, to describe this prolonged period of suspension when young people's access to social adulthood is delayed or denied. While their chronological age may define them as adults, they, are not, they have not been able to attain the social markers of adulthood, earning a living, being independent, establishing families, providing for their offspring and other relatives, and becoming taxpayers. Young people are consigned to a liminal space in which they are neither dependent children nor autonomous adults. Weighthood was first used by Diane Singerman in her work with youth in the Middle East as she looked at delayed family formation and the increasing rates of youth unemployment. I found this notion to be very helpful in capturing young people's feeling of being trapped or blocked in a stage of prolonged or permanent youth. Weightwood also evidences the multifaceted realities of young people's difficult transition to adulthood, which goes beyond securing a job and extends to aspects of their social and political life. Bongani, a young man I met in Soweto, a 30-year-old man, has not been able to, secure, uh, to, to find secure jobs since he finished matric several years ago. Bongani survives on temporary jobs, mainly replenishing shelves in supermarket and retail stores, which he tells me it's called merchandising. Bongani is not married, but has a child, and is unable to provide adequate support for his child. But Bongani's story is very common across the continent. Ibrahim Abdallah and Abubakar Momo have pointed out to the use in many West African countries of the vernacular term youth men to describe those who are stuck in this liminal position. Therefore, rather than defining youth on the basis of age groups, I understand youth as a socially constructed category defined by so social expectations and responsibilities. A 40-year-old who is unemployed and unmarried is still a youth man. In contrast, at the age of 10, child soldiers, aid or AIDS orphans, or child laborers assume adult roles, even if many of them at the later stage can be pushed back into weighthood. While Singerman's usage of weighthood suggests a sense of passivity, my own research indicates that young people are not merely waiting and hoping that their situation will change of, their, of its own accord. On the contrary, they are proactively engaged in serious efforts to create new forms of being and of interacting with society. Weighthood involves a long process of negotiating personal identity and financial independence. 
It represents the contradictions of modernity in which young people's expectations are simultaneously raised by the new technologies of information and communication that connect them to global cultures and constrained by the limited prospects and opportunities that they have at home. The severity of the impact of weighthood in the lives of young Africans depends on each individual's character, abilities, and life skills. But it is also, and largely, a function of their family background, level of education, and access to resources. Those from the middle class who are well connected are better placed to secure jobs and have a smoother transition into adulthood. But the experience of weighthood also differs by gender. Young men face the pressures of getting a steady job, finding a home, and covering the costs of marriage and family building. Although young women are becoming better educated, and have always engaged in productive labor alongside household cores, marriage and motherhood are still the most important markers of adulthood. While giving birth might provide girls an entry into adulthood, their ability to attain full adult status often depends on men moving beyond weighthood. Youth are especially vulnerable to the structural conditions that generate poverty and limit socioeconomic mobility. Declining opportunities in rural areas lead young men and women to migrate to the cities where their chances of finding employment and stable livelihoods remain very slim. Although growing numbers of young people are completing secondary education and even attending university, the mismatch between educational systems and the labor markets leaves many unemployed or underemployed. They are pushed into the oversaturated informal economy or become informal workers in a formal sector. Young Africans have developed their own terms to convey the extemporaneous and precarious nature of their lives. Young Mozambicans, for example, use the Portuguese expression desenrascar a vida, which means to hick out a living. Young Senegalese and Tunisians employ the French term debrouillage, which means, which means making do. And young South Africans used the expression, I'm just getting by. The idea of desenrascar a vida, or debrouillage, situates the weighthood experience in the realm of improvisation, of making, making it up as you go along, and entails a conscious effort to assess challenges and possibilities and plot scenarios conducive, conducive to the achievement of specific goals. Indeed, these young people operate like Levi Strauss's bricoleur, or a jack of all trades who manipulates and takes advantage of circumstances whenever possible to attain his or her own ends. Their actions sound like Michel Disserteau's tactics or daily struggles that respond to immediate needs rather than long-term strategies designed to achieve permanent goals. This experience and orientation is shared by young women and young men who engage in street vending, cross-border trading and smuggling, those who plan and plot to migrate illegally to South Africa or to Europe, and those who end up in criminal networks as swindlers, traffickers, and gangsters. 
young men and women also use their sexuality as means of gaining a livelihood by engaging in intimate relationships with sugar daddies and sugar mamas for money, gifts, and access to fashionable goods. Indeed, as Christian Grosgreen, Mark Hunter, and other scholars have pointed out, these new types of relationships are replacing previous patterns of intimacy amongst young people and are generating new understandings of masculinity and femininity. But some young people become successful entrepreneurs by repairing electronic devices, making and marketing clothing and jewelry, doing hair and nails, etc. Others are creating new artistic forms, both musical, performing and performing, and making graffiti, painting murals, writing blogs, and becoming savvy internet users. In this sense, young people in weighthood develop their own spaces where they subvert authority, bypass the encumbrances created by the state, and try to fashion new ways of functioning on their own. These youth spaces or youthscapes foster possibilities for creativity. And as Henrietta Moore points out, foster possibilities for self-stylization, which she, she describes as an obstinate search for a style of existence or a way of being. And this process of self-styling is made easier by cyber, cyber social networks such as YouTube, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Weighthood, therefore, constitutes, constitutes this twilight zone or this interstitial space where the boundaries between the legal and illegal, the proper and improper, the right and wrong are often very blurred. And it is precisely at this junction that young people are forced to make choices. And the choices they make will define their relationships towards work, family, intimacy, as well as the type of citizens they will become. Rather than being a short interruption in their transition to adulthood, weighthood is gradually replacing conventional adulthood itself. Many young people see weighthood as stemming from national and global policies that have failed to reduce poverty and to promote equitable and more broadly distributed economic growth. According to various political economists, structural adjustment programs have seriously weakened African states' abilities to determine national policies and priorities and to uphold the social contract with its citizenry. Bad governance, corruption, and the absence of fundamental freedoms compound this predicament. Recent accelerated growth rates in the continent bear considerable, considerable uh, promise. However, growth alone without equity will not guarantee social inclusion, inclusion and better lives for the majority of the population. Indeed, young people rebel against the widening gap between the rich and the poor and the rampant corruption that they observe as elites enrich themselves at others' expense. Young Africans today are generally better educated and more closely connected with the rest of the world than their parents were. The young people I interviewed through my research did not seem like a lost generation, as they are often labeled, nor did they appear apathetic towards what was happening in the societies surrounding them. 
they are acutely conscious of their marginal structural position and no longer trust the state's willingness and ability to find solutions for their problems. In their shared marginalization, young people are developing a sense of common identity and the critical consciousness that leads them to challenge established order. Like other social groups, the youth has always been involved in everyday processes of social change by fashioning the spaces within which they try to get by and assert their rights. Sociologist Asef Bayat calls these dispersed actions as non-movements, which he describes as quiet and unassuming daily struggles outside formal institutional channels in which everyday social activities blend with political activism. In Africa, young women and men engage in civil society associations, in popular culture, in debates through cyber network networks, and in political demonstrations. If we pay careful attention to the lyrics of their songs, to the verses of their poems, to the scripts of their plays, and to the discourses propagating in their Facebook pages, blogs, tweets, and SMSs, we uncover a strong critique of the status quo. But over the past few years, however, young people have moved from this quiet encroachment on public space to a more open and vociferous takeover of the national political stage. And they are questioning their Waitwood status and demanding better lives. By taking to the streets united and braving police, some have overthrown dictatorships, voted out corrupted leaders, and forced governments to reverse unpopular decisions. In fact, from the vintage point outside dominant ideologies, the younger generations are capable of envisioning society and polity anew precisely because of what Karl Meinheim has called fresh contact, which is defined as a no novel outlook that arises as the youth assimilate, develop, and alter the social and cultural repository received from previous generations. Yet, despite their successful protests, young Tunisians, Egyptians, Senegalese, and Burkinabe have not seen fundamental changes in their social economic conditions. They are disappointed with the new political forces that have taken over and remain deeply dissatisfied with the direction and slow pace of change. All of them realize that translating a protest movement into an ongoing political presence that takes, sh that takes shape, uh, that can shape public policies at national level constitutes indeed an immense challenge. Once all the regimes fall and the enthusiasm and energy of the streets protests wane, young activists find themselves more divided. The broad unity forged during street protests dissipates as they struggle to articulate a new common purpose and to define a new political role for themselves. For example, tensions within movements such as Sassoufi in Burkina Faso have exposed the internal divisions and the limitations of the broad, the broad horizontal front. Traditional and more established political forces have taken advantage of the political vacuum and quickly moved into in to occupy the space, often reverting to politics as usual while making some cosmetic changes. 
these ensconced political forces have proactively blocked the involvement of, of the younger generation in the political arena. For example, the banning of the April 6 youth movement by the Egyptian regime it recently in April 2014 on charges of distorting Egypt's image is a clear uh, uh, example of these kinds of situations. However, it is also clear that the horizontal and non-hierarchical structures adopted by these youth movements do not provide them with clear leadership to contend for power and enter the formal political arena. In the aftermath of street protests, young people appear to be retreating back to the periphery of formal politics. Many young activists denounce old style part party politics and object to being manipulated by politicians whom they often regard as corrupt and self-serving. They consciously distance themselves from partisan politics, refusing to transform their movements into formal parties. For example, the activists of the Yanamar in Senegal declined to join President Macky Sall's new cabinet or to form their own political party. Even those young activists who hold party memberships often complain that their voices are ignored. Sociologist and philosopher Simon Critchley suggests, suggests that the disconnection between youth and current political culture derives from the disassociation of power from politics. Power is the ability to get things done. And politics is the means to get those things done. And democracy is the system that allows for power to be exercised by the people. Today, the divorce of power from politics is deepening because power is being seized by supranational finance and trade corporations and by transnational organized crime syndicates. Devoid of power, politics remains localized in the nation state and responds to the interests of supranational powers rather than the will of the people. In this sense, Sovereignty is outsourced and democracy becomes a charade as politics has no power but instead serves power. Critchley reminds us that this separation between politics and power did not happen by chance but through the connivance of politicians who embraced free market capitalism as the engine for growth and personal gain. In the same vein, sociologist Aditya Nigam points to the crisis of the political and suggests that in the wake of the North African revolutions, these societies are living in an interregnum when the old forms of politics are becoming moribund and obsolete, but new ones have not yet emerged. Something clearly is waiting to be articulated in this relentless refusal of the political by the younger generation. Young people are already developing alternative sites for social and political intervention beyond party politics and within civil society organization. They establish and engage with movements and associations that involve political action without requiring party membership. They fight for freedom of expression in the real and virtual worlds. They head anti-corruption and open government campaigns. 
They work in youth leadership development programs, women's rights, environmentalism, and such like. But youth responses are not always constructive as their disappointment with party politics and with their weightwood condition may lead some to radicalization and to join movements such as ISIL, Al-Shabaab, and Boko Haram. It may also lead some to joining xenophobic networks that carry out attacks such as the ones witnessed recently in this country. However, Will youth civil society associations as platforms for political action be enough to help steer meaning meaningful political change? Will it be possible for the younger generation to drive the creation of a new political culture from outside dominant political structures? Will street protests remain young people's main mechanism for exerting pressure on those in power? How does this generation envision the new politics? These are some of the questions that will merit further research and analysis as the wave of youth protests and political transitions continues to unfold. Intriguingly, my young interlocutors seem to believe that it is possible to achieve fundamental change from outside dominant political structures, even if they have not yet fully articulated how to do so. In their view, transition processes are not linear. They take time and are full of twists and turns along the way. Nevertheless, there is no doubt that the, the Wadewood generation is already standing up for itself and making its mark in the world. And I thank you very much. Professor Onwana, we are extremely humbled and honored that you accepted our invitation to deliver this keynote address, this the seventh Africa Annual Memorial Lecture. I think, ladies and gentlemen, you will agree with me. Now we know why she is in such high demand internationally as a, a public intellectual and as a speaker. So thank you very much for your presence and for what you've shared with us. One of the most enduring questions, as you rightly point out, for the African continent is certainly how to interpret political change. Who gets to make it happen and on whose terms? And in this context, I want to thank you for sharing a thought-provoking array of insights on the precarious as well as the positive links between youth and political change in Africa. Two issues struck me, and I had the privilege of reading the lecture beforehand. The one issue of weighthood, I find that a fascinating notion, and I always get excited when people bring in the idea of liminality and the in-betweenness and the, the twilight, and it's not because I like vampires. <laughs> I think that from a scholarly point of view, it's at that in-betweenness, at that liminal space where scholarship is made, where cutting edge issues are being addressed, but at the same time also where real change happens in the everyday life. Secondly, I think that I am really deeply encouraged by the fact that you are positive about our youth in this, um, on this continent. They are not a lost generation, as you point out. They are actively shaping the meaning of politics as well as the meaning of civil society. So I would like to ask my colleague, Dr. Stephanie Kaywood, Program Director of African Studies, to hand over a token of our appreciation to Professor Honwana. And 
then I can just also mention that the lecture will be on our website in the next couple of days. So watch out for that. In the spirit of youth, as the theme for Africa Day this year, the Center for Africa Studies also wishes to make a small donation um, of the amount of 5,000 Rand to the No Student Hungry Project. For those of you who do not know about the wonderful work that the project has done, maybe I can remind you that um, a study or a survey done by the Department of Nutrition and Dietetics found that more than 59% of our own students suffer food insecurity. So in other words, they don't, ne they don't know when and where the next meal is going. So I'm asking the um, acting dean of students, Ms. Cornelia Farson and Ms. Vicky Simpson, to accept our donation. allow me to thank V Chords for the inspiring performance, but I, I know I'm not J-Lo, but I got <laughs> gooseies, as they say. So well done, it was wonderful. Thank you for that. And to Dr. Lange um, for your welcome and your opening address. Thank you for your presence as well. And then Professor Buertis, as usual, always as the Dean of our faculty, thank you for the introduction of Professor Onwana. And then to the team, the CAS team, all of you and also the student volunteers, thank you for the hard work and the work isn't done yet, tomorrow is lying ahead, more work. Um, thank you for being able to rely on you and your extreme professionalism. And to Joe Nell and the university's team also for the arrangements and the support and then also for tackling um, load shedding head on. Um, finally, to everybody of you, thank you for coming, and I also want to remind you that this project, as Dr. Lange mentioned, forms part, or this lecture forms part of a bigger project, so there's more to come. We have some programs at the uh, door, for those of you who are interested to attend the sessions tomorrow. We have three, three interesting sessions, there's one on collectively born unfree, so we continue the theme of youth and linguistic tokenism and branding through art in South African advertising, and then also an extract from the play, Playland. So please come and enjoy the last bit of Africa Day celebrations at the UFS tomorrow. So thank you for coming, and I ask that you just allow the procession to leave the room first. Thank you. <laughs>